All praise and honor and glory be yours, Almighty Father. You are exalted in the heavens. You are exalted here on earth and in our midst. We praise you for your presence. How gracious you are, how loving you have been. You've embraced us with your mercy and grace. You have strengthened us. You have encouraged us step by step. And you have led us thus far. And we long to hear from you. We long to listen to you. We long to follow you and to live for your glory. And even now, Lord, we want to praise you again and again. We want to lift our hearts to you, Almighty God. And as we sing, as we dance, as we pray, we, our hearts are uplifted and excited because we belong to your kingdom. We are your children and we praise you and thank you. All glory, honor, thanks and praise. We adore you, Almighty God. In Jesus' name, Amen. Praise God today as we come together at this season. We can honor Him again with praises and time and worship. I'm sure you have been blessed. Thank you for worship team as you have brought us into the presence of God. Our hearts are lifted. I am touched also personally. I am as I grow old, I become more emotional. My tears come out easily, so you excuse me if I break down at times. I want to share with you the subject that we've been dealing with for the whole month, and that is sharing. And you'll read from Eileen. Uh, I will read from the literal translation, literal translation from the Greek, and a translation into English. And some of the Tagalog also is quite close to the literal translation. Chinese Bibles are translation from the English versions in the past. So they still use the English meaning. But the literal translations, the vernacular, use the literal translation. And actually, the word sharing is not there in the Greek. But we have used it as sharing. So you are re hearing of your love and faith, which you have toward the last gospel and toward the saints so that the fellowship of your faith may operate in a full knowledge of every good thing in you for Jesus Christ. So it is not sharing of your faith, but it is the fellowship of your faith in the little translation. So we can reduce, we can think that sharing may mean fellowship also. Okay? So we're having Bible study now. Uh, fellowship of your faith in, in the literal translations in, in the vernacular. But in the Revised Standard Version and uh, International Version and also in the King James Version, you find sharing of your faith. And I heard somebody using this verse to speak about sharing the gospel. That is only part of it one or two. There might be four parts of the sharing, but one of them is presenting the gospel. But it's not completely that. 
because it's a very powerful word, this word fellowship koinonia, and it's going to be meaningful to us because it says fellowship. What is fellowship? So we will turn to Acts chapter 2. Acts chapter 2, what happened in the early church? Acts chapter 2, next question. What happened there? We find in Acts chapter 2, verses 42 to 47, they met together after the Holy Spirit came. They were worshiping together. Some call it worshiping. So fellowship can mean worship also. So it includes worship, part of it. So they had the apostles teaching. Then they had the fellowship, it says, and the breaking of bread and the prayers. They had all these things in that fellowship meeting, that worship meeting. So the apostles teaching, they had the preaching by some of the apostles. When? Did they begin with the preaching first? We don't know the order. Because they had no order. They spoke spontaneously. So sometimes they were singing and somebody stands up and gives the word. And then they continue singing, praising. And then somebody will prophesy. And then someone else will give the interpretation. And then they will be singing, dancing sometimes. And so it goes on, and the prayers. And then they have communion, the Lord's table, signifying the Lord himself is present there with them. Because lo, I will be all the way until the end of the world. That presence, and do this in remembrance of me, when he says that, they remember him very dearly. Jesus was present. In their minds, in their emotions, in their very presence, the Holy Spirit gave them the presence of God. So they were moved. They have order. Do we have order here in our worship? Yes, we have order. Some order. But if you go to a Catholic church, there's more order. Or Anglican church, Presbyterian church, Baptist church, there are real definite order. If you break that order, it is not a church service or worship to them, to some of them. But in that time in Acts, there was no order. Have you been to a church like that? I've been, uh, one is a Hillsong church in America. Another one was a Pentecostal church. And the closest one is a Brethren church. Brethren. They don't have pastors, they're elders. And the elder will take the pastor teaching and they will teach. One or two or three people in one service. You can hear three sermons. So if you are in a hurry to go back home and have your nap and rest, this church in Acts went the whole day sings. You have no time to go back if you're in the spirit. So, church in Acts chapter 4 and chapter 2, it goes on and on and on. Maybe it might go to the night meeting. That's it. So, this is how it went in a spontaneous, no time limit. When they got together, they preached the word, they spent time with each other, the fellowship, they had their experiences, they had. And having a meal together. Having a meal is very meaningful to the Jew, to the Arab, to the Middle East people, and also to us, also to a certain extent. To have a meal is very important. Means if I invite you to my house and we have a meal, you, I am bound by hospitality to welcome you and give you whatever you need and to make you comfortable, and also to safeguard your stay and protect you, even when you go outside. Usually, a meal was a sign of a covenant among the Jews. It's also in the buildings. So that if you have a meal together, 
and you're going to agree on something, some condition, then you usually end up with a meal. And that was a covenant seal, eating together, you bound together. So when we're having meal here, to some extent, we are bound to each other. Amen? Yeah. Uh, we care for each other. And we are trying to follow the covenant meals. Not like a Jew, but like New Testament Christians. We eat together, we spend time together, we share together our problems, our needs. That is the fellowship they look for. And I'm sure you're looking for such fellowship here also. So, so fellowship, breaking of bread, the prayers, offering, song, songs, dance, praises, all goes on. Verse 47, chapter 2. And then in chapter 4, verse 32, the fellowship of the faith, <clears throat> it continues on. Acts chapter 2. Uh, it says, not, oh, we'll have the next one. Acts 4 32 says, All the believers were of one heart and mind. No one claimed that any of his possessions was his own, but they shared everything they had. That was in the church. Will you share everything you have? No way. <laughs> still have a lot of money, you don't give everything, but in this case it doesn't mean everyone emptied their pockets, it doesn't mean that. Whatever they had, they were willing to give, depending on the need, and also a sign of worship and offering, they did. But remember, these people are not rich, they are the poor, some of the poorest in the community and the society. And they should not be able to give anything. But they gave. And this is why it's amazing. They were ready to share what they had. And they did that voluntarily. And they gave. And this was an expression of enthusiastic love. They cared for each other. You do that. If you care for someone, you're willing to give and give. Have you found people here? Have you found people here in Taiwan who are willing to give and give because they care for you? The company doesn't. If you work, they'll give you. If you work, they'll exploit you still. And so here they are. Are you willing to give and give if you care? I think. You can't care for everybody at the same time. But there are exceptional cases of people who need care. And you can give. There's a choice there. It's voluntary. So in this new church in Acts, people were willing to give. And that is part of the sharing, the fellowship of the faith. Fellowship together. Not just singing, dancing, and Pray, but also caring, spending time, listening, and counseling maybe, and then share whatever the material needs may be, physical, emotional, all needs are supposed to be met in a fellowship. So we are trying to practice that to some extent. Here were people giving. Some people give because they want prestige. Oh, I can give. I want a name. And you find one of the problems we have back home in our churches is there are some rich people and they give a lot. Some are millionaires and they can give a lot if they want. And what does the church do? They make them committee members, council members. They have no spiritual interest, but they want power also within the church. So they give. They have other motives, other reasons. In this case, it was out of genuine love and expression of care. 
And those who receive it, those who receive the gifts, uh, the offering, they were not supposed to be embarrassed. And they are supposed to humbly, willingly, praising God, accept it as from God. So the giver is blessed and the receiver is blessed too. And that is the place I think I would like to be in all the time. I think you would like to be there. Would you like to be there? I think this is where we find there is unity, oneness of spirit. They have, they have been uplifted because they came and it is a place like that where God's spirit dwells and there is blessing, miracles happen, and numbers increase. Amen? Amen. Why did they do this? Who taught, who taught them to do all this? They, of course, in their cultural background, the Jews and all those living in that area, they help one another. I think we have that in almost every culture. We try to help each other depending. And here in the New Testament church, they were more than the usual giving, beyond what is expected. They give, they pour out their hearts in their giving. So the reason, main reason why they continue, I want to put is maybe because the living savior was still really real to them <clears throat> in their lives, in their thinking, in their hearts, they remember the words of Jesus, his movements, the way he talked, the way he spoke, where he slept, where he ate, what food he ate. All that replayed in their minds again and again and again and reminded them of the words of Jesus. So we have the next one. I think this is a response, a response to the teaching of Jesus Christ, why they give. I don't know if you can all read this, they're very small. Okay. Uh, it's the response to the teaching of Christ. Not just their own initiative, or not just because they care, they are nice people. Not just that. More than being nice, they were doing something extra because of the teaching of Jesus. As a love expression to Jesus Christ. Remember the rich young ruler? Do you find that? Yes. Luke 18. What happened? He was a rich man, young man. He was a big boss in his company and very influential. Everybody respected him. And what more? He was religious, a religious Jew. He told Jesus, I've done all those things. So he went to the synagogue, he did all the offerings, and he gave to the poor, and he gave to the temple also. So he fulfilled all the law, according to him. But then Jesus said, one thing you lack, sell all that you have, and give to the poor. And then take up your cross and follow me. And you follow me. Now that was beyond the expectation of the law, beyond the law. And this is where in Acts chapter 4, those people were acting beyond the law. They were in the law of the spirit, where there is freedom to give, freedom to love people, care. And this is where they gave. So the rich young ruler tells us that even though you look very nice, you go to church every time, you give, sometimes sacrificially, all that, until and unless the Holy Spirit comes and moves you to give more. And this is where I think, I'm not appealing for giving more to the church, I'm just narrating what I think is sharing and fellowship means, if there is true fellowship. So for the rich, he told in Luke chapter 6, remember in Matthew chapter 5, blessed are the poor in spirit, he said. 
But here, in Luke, he does not say in spirit. He said, blessed are the poor. And woe to them who are rich. Not because they are rich out of sinful gain. But that riches can block you from seeing God's kingdom and the interest in God's kingdom. So there was a warning there. Rich versus the camel. You know that. Unless a rich man is able to go through that needle, needle with a small gate on the walls of the city of Jerusalem. And that small gate, only a human being might be able to crawl through. A child might be able to crawl, crawl through uh, on their knee. And so Jesus was saying the impossible. It will be easier for the camel to go through that small gate than for a rich man to enter into the kingdom. So Jesus was not encouraging the riches, but the dangers of riches. <coughs> so the attitude, and the next one is attitude for the world's riches. Luke chapter 12, Matthew 5, all these gives us, if you are going to aim for that, it becomes an idol. And when that becomes an idol, then your priorities are different. Your priorities are going to be different. Of course, your priority coming here to Taiwan, what is it? It's to get money too. Free of home and salary back home, you get it in one month. If you go to Singapore, you get more than Arab countries even. Uh, okay, it depends. What are your priorities? But once you are into that fellowship, wherever you come from, whatever background, and how much salary you get, that does not matter. Because it's how the Holy Spirit moves you to give in the fellowship. A fellowship where you have regular bread, the singing, the praise, uh, the preaching, sharing of experiences, and meals at the Lord's table. All that included. Example, there's Barnabas. What did Barnabas do? Barnabas sold his land. He must be a rich man. He sold his land. So there were some people who were rich. Not all of them were poor. The poor meaning they were servants. Some were redeemed slaves. Some were soldiers. And most of many of them in the time of Acts chapter 2 and chapter 4, they were foreigners, foreign Jews coming into Jerusalem. So among them, here Barnabas must be a middle class. He had man. He sold it and gave it to the church. And they take it and then they distribute it immediately to whoever is in need. There are always people who are poor, always in need. So they gave. Really, no conditions, no strings attached, no come no, 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 no. They don't have to pay back. They praise God for that. They're grateful they came. Okay? And this is where it was abused. When they saw Barnabas being praised as an example, others began to give. And then came the warning, Ananias and Sapphira. Next chapter. They want to do the same thing, get the same publicity, get the same praise, but they did do 100% as Barnabas did. They may have done 25% or 50%. In the eyes of the public, it looked good. They were like a rich young ruler. They fulfilled all the laws of the fellowship. They fulfilled, but the Holy Spirit knew and judgment came upon them. I think that is a warning of hypocrisy, of pretending. How many of you have shared? You may have shared a lot in your family, sacrificially, and I think you do. 
I think that was the condition of Jesus. Because Jesus was willing to share everything he had. And I'm just thinking of one story in my own mind. Because as I tell you this, am I doing, willing to do this? And so one day, of course I was in Christian ministry. I didn't get much salary. And there was one university student who didn't have a dormitory to stay. So they asked, his uncle came to my house and asked me, can this boy stay here and go to college from your house? I said, okay, that's fine. And so he stayed with me for two years. We didn't ask for any charge or money. He just want to stay, let him stay. So when he stayed there, somehow he became converted, gloriously converted. Not just through me, but through the fellowship that we are having. And something out of him from the past, he was a uh, demon, was cast out from him. And that completely changed him. He was shy. He didn't want to talk in English, like some of you. Uh, he didn't want to talk or speak. Even when he spoke, it was very broken English. And he was afraid people would laugh at him. But when he got converted, he was released. He was not ashamed anymore. He spoke, he preached, he testified with his broken English. People laughed, he didn't care. As long as he communicated the gospel, and our numbers increased. And so we lived together there, and we shared. We had a tin can, milk can. Empty milk can, which we finish. When he gets money from home, he puts everything in there. When I get my little salary, I put everything in there. And from there we pay the rent. And then the electrical bills, everything. No questions asked. If I need to go shopping, I'll take the money, go shop, and come back. If he needs to shop, he'll take the money, go and do the shopping, and then they'll also do the cooking. So we took turns in washing dishes even. Uh, no question asked. The money was there. If there's no money, then we don't eat. We go visit somebody else. Uh, we shared like that for two years. And God used this man in a wonderful way, more than I could ever imagine. He was strong, young, enthusiastic, with all his zeal, he could communicate the gospel. Then he went to his home, home, home area, province. And there he became a well-known evangelist, having meetings in churches, conferences, and camps. These are places I cannot go. He could go where I could not go. And I think he made more conversions of people more than me. And I praise God for that, for the time we have to share. And I think that is what is happening in the sharing part. As if you're willing to share, you, don't, you can't share that with everybody. God chooses a certain person and brings them to your life. And we share that. And my family today is very much similar. We have a joint bank account. If we need, we just tell each other, I need this, we just take it, no question asked. My brother needs money, let's take that money, no question asked. It goes on. Even in a family life, between husband and wife. That's amazing. But this is where it began, the teaching of Jesus. And it should begin from there, not because I'm kind-hearted or I have a good vision. No, because the Spirit of God leads us to that. And this is where my priority is not money, it's God's kingdom, his interest. And money will be used accordingly. I think you heard the song, and you sung it. You don't sing it these days. For me, I sing it, I listen to it on YouTube, Jim Reed sing it. I rather have Jesus than silver and gold. I think you all know that song. You don't sing it anymore, it's a very old song. 
Okay. I think that speaks what my priority is not the money. My priority is God. 